Hey, welcome everyone to the RKCAD user monthly webinar for, well, this is March 2020. This is, it was going to be in November. I mean, it's in, oh God, it was going to be in February. We had a schedule conflict. So uh, anyway, welcome to Christian Bursell of Australia. How are you doing, Christian? Good, thanks, Eric. Uh, pleased to be here. Very excited. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, this is a special opportunity for all of you to see a cutting edge uh, technology that is integrated into Archicad. Uh, Christian's been doing some really um, advanced work with Archicad's object creation and management tools, uh, which are built on a, tool, uh, a framework called the Geometric Description Language, or GDL. And actually, GDL was the origin of Archicad rather than the reverse. In other words, it wasn't like Archicad existed as a modeling tool, and then somebody said we should create uh, a scripting language. In fact, when Gabor Boyar created it with um, uh, some colleagues back in the early 80s, they created a language for describing elements in space that was very um, compact, precise, and could be actually uh, rendered in a tiny little computer. The HP mini computers, Hewlett Packard mini computers of the time, are probably the equivalent of like, well, le much less than what you have in an iPhone right now, but like a pocket calculator, you know, from 10 years later. Um, so anyway, that's that was the origin of Archicad. Uh, now let's just make sure everybody can hear us and see us, because uh, that's always a good thing to do. So we have a questions area where you can fill in, um, you know, you can say hello, tell us where you're calling in from. Now, if you're in my Archicad training programs, you can use the Slack workspace to uh, communicate with us. Um, so that would, we'll do it under the coaching call section, um, even though it's not a coaching call, but uh, you know, you can say that. And I see uh, Jimmy saying no picture. Right now, we're, you should just be seeing our webcams. Hopefully, hopefully you're seeing us. Um, not just hearing us. So, uh, okay, Chris from BC says, all good, yeah. And Dwight up in Southern Ontario, Joel, Concord, California. Okay, excellent. And John from Salt, Sp Salt Spring. All right, so we're gonna get going. So um, now that I know that everybody's around, you can just keep filling in your information. Um, <clears throat> it's always fun to see how many continents we cover because we certainly cover a lot of cities, but usually we get people from uh, Europe, North America, Australia, and sometimes from South America and Africa. Uh, and so, all right, yeah, a lot of people chiming in um, from, from Grenada and the, and the Caribbean, Nigeria. Okay, we do have uh, um, Mukhtar from Nigeria. All right, and Saudi Arabia, Abdullah uh, from Saudi Arabia. So, okay. So, um, Christian, tell us about your work. Just, you know, how did you get into Archicad and, and GDL? And we'll start seeing things on screen in a little bit, but just focus sure. on, on you as yeah, a person. Uh, I was kind of thrown into it. Um, I, I took some time off the, my architecture degree uh, to get out into the workforce. Um, I did a, I got a certificate in building design and drafting, so I'd have a qualification. First job, they said, oh, you're the new kid on the block. We're moving to, you know, virtual building. So new software. So you've got to teach us how to do this stuff. And I'm like, well, I haven't touched it. And they said, well, here's the manual. Go home, read it, and then come back and teach us. And that was Archicad. Um, I had 6.5. Um, so I was, I was quite young. I was living with my uncle and auntie, and I would lie on my bed at night reading a technical manual on software. It was... Um, Looking back, it seems quite depressing, but it was actually a very exciting time. Um, I took to Archicad like a fish to water and um, I just constantly wanted to evolve the processes and do things smarter. Um, so that sort of, it was only maybe second or third year um, I discovered GDL um, and I thought, you know, there's ways to use this to automate more. So I, I got into that. The main thing I was looking at then when I first looked at GDL was I wanted shelf lines on my joinery. I didn't want to have to draw them in elevations. And I thought, surely with all this intelligence, I don't have to draw these things. Um, 
So I read the GDL reference guide, just the first few chapters, got an understanding of it and opened the object and just started playing. And it was, it was fantastic. My, my father and older brother are both uh, programmers of some note and my, all my mother's side of the family are mathematicians. So a geometric description language was just perfect for me. It just made perfect sense. Um, and it's basically been since that point, which is 2003, 2004, or that I'd focus on making GDL my 100% of my daily tasks. I, I just really get a kick out of it. Um, I think it's quite amazing. I know it's um, it's difficult to work with. It's a little archaic in its syntax and, and management and, and all that sort of thing, um, but I'm sure that's changing. Um, but as far as the capabilities, like you sort of think of the capabilities of mathematics and that's your limitations in GDL. So there are really many limitations. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's that's sort of mainly what got me started and um, got me, me step, started. Let me just step, step in for a minute. <clears throat> so all of you who use ARCHICAD use GDL every single day. Why? Because all the library parts are written in GDL. You can create your own library parts just graphically by drawing some stuff and then saving it as a library part. Well, what ARCHICAD does in the background is it converts it to a series of text descriptions saying, draw this surface, draw this volume, you know, move over here and draw something else. And that's all GDL. And some of the magic are the fact that you can say, how many mullions do you want? How many divisions do you want for the window? And you say two and it figures out, you know, the spacing. You say five and it figures a different spacing out. And so it's creating geometry based on instructions and based on intuitive specifications, you know, you just type in a value, you pick something from a parameter list, and it does that. So, what have you been able to do? You know, we're going to look at examples of it, but just what are some of the cool things that you've been able to do just from a very high level? You know, um, well, look, it, it probably started. There, there are a few things I discovered. Obviously, uh, you know, I worked with JDL. Um, I left. Uh, the current position, I went and worked with Cody Parker Architects. They said I was going to be there for GDL purposes, but I was mainly just documenting. I got a bit sick of that. Um, but after, since about 2007, I've been doing nothing. Well, since about the, the GFC in 2008, I've been doing all GDL. So you end up doing so much of it that you, you understand all the different parts of it. So it was learning about new capabilities. The first one that really sort of um, piqued my interest was the communication with an external text file. Um, so I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. So I can put data in this text file and it can control data in my GDL objects. Um, I played around with that. There were a few, there's a few sort of um, inefficiencies in, in that. If you update the text file, you basically need to reload the library to get the changes of those text files. It was then suggested that I have a look at the XML um, add on in Arcad, which is the exact same as the text one, but it's just working in an XML file. And then you therefore have to navigate the what's called the, the tree of the XML file, or they call it traversing, traversing the XML tree. So that so was a bit. I'm going to stop you right there, uh, Christian, just because those words and, and that description, while I understand that most people won't know what sure. this relates to so let's pull up um let me make you presenter you can start showing you know, your website some where these have been applied and then of course show some of the magic that happens when you um actually use it so i'm going to make you presenter uh mm -hmm. here so go ahead and share your screen and uh you know then let, let's look at things and and tell us what we're seeing sure i'm probably just seeing that comment. So what we've got in the, if we're just looking at the website here, um, this is the current website. We're, we're revamping this for, um, for better management of, of um, subscriptions and that, but this is as it is at the moment. So these are the objects. So basically um, the infinite basins, it communicates with XML files. Um, so does infinite openings and infinite sinks. And um, there's also a couple other ones that I haven't put up here yet. There's a, I've got an infinite capping and then I've also got this object called infinite anything, which can basically be any shape. So I'll show you what they do. 
we'll just go into this project. This is just a small residential project, my own residence that we've been working on, now in the hands of an architect. Um, this is one of the early objects, a, a sink object. I'll just go into its settings. So this is still a little bit um, old school from my perspective as to, as to how I developed this. So what you'll see, I'll just bring this down a little bit. We've got a page in here called Component Catalogs and Assemblies. This is basically where you configure how this element talks with the, the XML file. So there's a series of different databases. At the moment, we're just using a, an internal one here, which means that's a database that's loaded in the library and we're storing components. So if I go to um, the sync modification, these are all the aspects of the sync that, that basically allow me to shape this sync up um, in whatever way I want. It's, it's very capable. I can do a, a polygon sync with any number of bowls and drainers and recesses in it. And I can shape those elements uh, using the polygon function. So what happens um, if I just have a look at one of these ones that I've got here, set this to, so you can see there's also image files for these components. So I've created a laundry tub, a one and three quarter drain of sink and a, a contour sink. So you can sort of see that this element is capable of doing different shapes. That's the actual where you define the profile. That, get, that gets turned off when you turn off the um, hotspot. But you can see there's all these hotspots in here for basically controlling um, different parts of the edge. This is locked to that configuration. So if I hit custom, I think can then go in here and I can start modifying this. I can modify um, the, the edges of the contours. I can modify these arcs. Um, I can also modify the size and positioning of the basins and the waste in relation to those. And then I can go in and I can save those. So let's just say um, I want to get rid of this sink here. I go into here, I go to modify, I go to bowls, and I bring that down to one. Okay, so now it's just a one basin element. I can then go save that. If I go back to my component catalogs and I come in here and I give this a name, the original name was CS Contour Sync. So what we might do is we just might do that. Um, CS Contour Sync and then call it one bowl. Okay, and now, um, where's my store button? <laughs> There is supposed to be a store button here. Uh, this is probably not the best example. Let me go to the next page where that element is controlled. The store button should be down there. I've redone this interface. So there's been a lot of work. Um, oh, that's going into the internal catalog. That's going into the macro. So let's go to the loaded libraries. This is going to allow me to store this and go to this library. So see now I've got this store button. That was going into an internal macro. So that's that sort of has changed. So please don't pay any attention to that. As I said, this is sort of still in the old version of this component catalogs. So if I now click store, I should have checked, checked this. Let me do it with the object that is more advanced. Let's go and do it in the windows and doors. Okay, so this is um, the infinite openings tool, which you'll receive as part of this um, session as a complimentary gift. We'll go back to its component catalogs and features. And this, you can see there, now this is a little bit more of an advanced interface. So this is where the interface is gonna go for, for the sync tool at the moment. Uh, this is not stored as a component of any shape. You can see that everything is, here is custom. So this is the assembly. Here we have overall shape, panel arrangement, frame profile, mullion profile, subframe. Um, we've then got further down here, we've got all our operable elements in there as well. So you can see these are set to casements. 
and there's there's no, there's no definition for what they are at the moment. They're all just set to custom. This is completely custom element. So what I want to do is I want to reuse this element so I can go through and store things. So if I just go through and say the first thing I want to store is um, the, the panel type of these operable elements, sort of working the way up. So I click on this panel element and I have a look at the settings, 30 by 30, that's what I'm after. So what I'm going to do is I'll open up this database and I'm going to store this. Okay, so to store it, to have permission to store, I need to have a password in here. That sort of locks it out so that not any user can modify these databases. If I go back to that panel element, sorry, just looking over the camera, and I'll give it a name. Uh, I'll just call it um, casement 01. So this is the main casement profile for these panels for this project. I'll then hit upload. This is my little upload cloud here. And then I'll hit download so that I receive that information back. And I can come here and you can see there's my casement 01 element. Okay, so now that that window is, is locked to that element and that's in opening three. So if I go into, I can do opening one, I'll lock it to the casement as well. And I'll do opening two and I'll lock it to that. So they're now locked to those definitions. If I wanted to create a different casement, or if I decided that this casement element, let's have a look at this in 3D, so we can sort of see it nicely. If I wanted this panel to be a different size, and this is a, a project specific thing, then I could go back into here and I could change casement 01 by unlocking it and just saying the, these need to be 40. So just set them all to 40. Then I reload that, that modifies it, download so I've got the latest data, click OK, and every single panel adjusts accordingly. So that's it's kind of the basic way you can control different elements within the project. I can control the panel styles of all my panels using this database as, a, as the control point. This object obviously can goes I, a lot. Can I jump in? Yeah, question. sure. So I want to translate sort of what you've been doing um, into some of the essential, uh, let's say, features that are distinct from what we normally see. Now, your interface is a little bit hard to follow, and this is the first time I've seen it. Uh, I'm sure once you work with it, it'll be familiar. But yeah. we're all used to the fact that you go into any object, like a window or door, and there are going to be options for changing the parameters. Now, when you change the parameters of a window or door to a different setting, uh, you can save it as a favorite. Uh, you can, of course, drag copies of it around in your project. Uh, you can eye drop it, etc. So you do have the ability to do a fair amount of customization in the standard library components and yeah. save commonly used settings. Now, what one of the things that uh, uh, that became clear when I was talking with you, Christian, was that uh, the management of these, um, this sort of a design choice uh, in a small project is not so hard. But when you get into larger projects, one of the things is you may make a design decision to change something about uh, you know, the way that doors are done or the way that um, sinks are done or the way that any element is done. Sure. And it, instead of it being a favorite that you have to, you, that where you'd have to go find all of the ones that have been applied like that and um, reapply uh, that, uh, and which becomes impossible if you're talking about subcomponents, like mm -hmm. changing just part of an element. That's right. Um, what you've got is um, is you, you're saving the definition, all of the sort of settings yes. in a special XML database. Yes, that's um, correct. And, and you can give it a name, so similar to a favorite. Um, and then if you redefine that, all of the elements in the project update. Now, you've told us, uh, told me about the Queen's Wharf project. So let's just talk about the extreme 
an extreme case. So the Queen's Wharf project, tell us a little bit about that. It's it's a huge project in which city in Australia? Yeah, so it's, a, it's a huge, massive project in Brisbane. I've got a little bit of a um, thing here on it somewhere. This is this is the Queen's Wharf. I think this is straight out of the, I um, know oh that's not the Cotty Parker. This is the Cotty Parker website. So Cotty Parker are the firm that have done Queen's Wharf. They're an Archicad firm. They've been with Archicad for many, many years now. Um, I first worked with them in 2000 five when they were um, an ICAD firm then. Uh, this is the project that you see here, sort of um, just off to the side of the screen, um, including the foreshore as well. It's 10% of the Brisbane um, Central Business District. So it's a fairly massive project. It's three buildings um, and it's a, I think it's a $3.5 billion project and there's a, a, a majority of it is public space as well so you can even see up here there's a bit of a sky deck thing that's all public space and also there's a whole lot of um, foreshore redevelopment as well so um, very large project they um, contacted me they were using um, some old versions of my window and door tools the the swift window and door tool um, and they had sort of built most of this model um, using that as well as um, generic ARCHICAD objects. Um, and even I think there might have even been some CAD image stuff in there. Um, they were having problems with how they're going to manage the components of these parts and how they're going to manage the data within the project. So if you're not aware, this project has committed to a, a 99 um, year digital um, model. So they've got to maintain a digital model, which includes the ARCHICAD files um, for a period of 99 years and have those files workable. So they really need some robust ways to control the different elements in, in the project. So, and doing them based on types um, is, is basically where they've sort of come to. So they uh, snatched up this infinite openings and basically proceeded to replace every door and window in this building with infinite openings. I spoke to Quinn and yesterday and that's somewhere around, um, or he says it's well over 10,000 instances of the element. So there's 10, over 10,000 instances of infinite openings in this project. And they're basically using that to make sure that all the frames indoors are the same, all the panels are the same, all the door furniture is the same. Even they're doing it, they do a fair bit of work with the grills in the doors for specific purposes in, without, throughout the building um, and viewing panels. And they've got to make sure that all those are tied to a certain component definition that they can control, so they can control it through the whole project. Mm -hmm. So it, it, let me just take a little parallel here. So I think that most Archicad users have uh, explored the idea of creating a composite for a custom profile and uh, possibly taking something from the standard template and just making a duplicate copy of it and modifying it somewhat or creating it from scratch. And what you probably know, but you know, may or may not, uh, uh, that everybody uh, may or may not know it, is that if you change the definition of that composite profile or uh, a complex profile or that composite, that all the elements that have been assigned to it update. And we sort of take it for granted. Okay, so if I redefine it, then these elements update. Well, think about it in terms of windows and doors. Um, it's like changing the favorite or just going and selecting, you know, a bunch of parts, but you're actually just changing it in one place, which is the definition. That's um, right. So that's, that's a tremendously powerful management tool mm -hmm. where any decision that, you know, you make in this context um, can percolate through the entire Set. And with 10,000 doors and windows, of course, it's hard to select them all in a single 3D view and That's wait hard. for it to update. But if you just change the definition, then whenever you look at any section, any elevation, etc., it'll be using the latest version of it. So that's, that's very true. powerful. Um, can you show us anything more from their site that, or that would be of interest in this context? Um, I don't know, there's a few things, this site, this doesn't really have it. I mean, you can jump on and have a look at this video as well and it takes you few, through a few things. Um, there's also a, a document that's put out, I think there's a second one coming out shortly on, on it, that sort of goes through all the achievements. So this building has won awards as well from 
um, building smart uh, on their different operability and all those sorts of things and, and lots of other awards. It's quite a massive project. It's considered a mega project. Um, so they're winning lots of awards on how they're actually are managing the digital asset and their data. Um, this is something that's been, you know, it's been a bit of a pain point for me over the years that people are not realising the value of that digital model they're creating with Archicad. And I think this project really does, um, it does hit the mark there. It does emphasise the value of that model that you're creating and how that data can be exploited and used by other parties down the track. So this has to go into full um, facility management um, information and all that sort of thing as well. So it's a really big, management is the main part of this project. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's kind of the main main strength of, of the tools I've created as well. They weren't created for this project. I was working on these functionalities. I've been working on these functionalities for seven years now um, to refine it and get it to happen seamlessly. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's sort of, it, it's great to have projects like this come along and finally people do start to exploit these elements that we're creating. I mean, your listeners have been using Archicad for years and creating mod models for years, using it probably mostly for documentation. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sure there's some of them out there that are using it for to get greater information to consultants and things like that. Um, and I think that's really how the intelligence we can put into Archicad means we can get quite a lot out of it quite easily. And that's what they're um, representing here with the Queen's Wharf building. So I think we should all be, you know, proud of uh, our colleagues down there um you know who are doing this massive project and i think uh I i'm pretty sure that the type of integrative approach that they're taking um is succeeding in archicad better than it would in in uh other tools now uh, an interesting point came in and it's sort of like one of those questions that you hope somebody's going to ask because it's a perfect question that's from tom Marcunis saying the window customization only makes sense if trying to match a window from a manufacturer's catalog, it would only be a very wealthy catalog uh, custom client who could afford a custom built window. So tell us, um, you know, we haven't really seen how flexible all of this is in all the details, but even just with the assumption that, hey, you can make it represent any manufacturer's window, how are you approaching manufacturers and where is this going down the line okay. is, is is the big promise of what you're doing yeah sure look this, this whole thing came about oh and i'll demonstrate that right now but this whole thing came about because i was after you know doing a fair bit of years of just gdl for um for architects i, I needed to get into the manufacturing game because that's you know where where it was a lot easier to make a, a living um and after a few years of doing projects in that, I was sort of thinking, you know, this is not really working. We've got great generic objects and then we've just basically got these manufacturers objects. They're not paying to have them developed really intelligently. So there needs to be a better system. And that's when I started playing around with the text file and, and XMLs and, and came up with this logic that the manufacturer's data could sit in the XML. So I'll just show you that right now. I'll just go into, it doesn't really matter what element I use because they can all change. So I can just select this element here go into the settings, go to my component catalog. So this is where all the different databases are stored. Um, we've had a manufacturer come on board already in ASA Abloy. Um, that's ASA Abloy Entrance Systems down here in Australia. So it's just the Australian counterpart of ASA Abloy. And they've uh, put up a, a reasonable amount of their context, um, but they're looking to put all their, every single product up um, available for this. This also came about because they wanted to get some products into Queen's Wharf, so they kind of had to choose this path. But now they've seen it, they, they love it. So all you gotta do is um, in the first page of the interface, component catalogs and assemblies, you choose a database. So there's an SR Boy database available here. If you have a look at some of the other components, they've also got SR Boy databases. Um, not every single one of them does because SR Boy don't do absolutely everything. In, in this field. Um, but if we want to change this to uh, one of the ASA Abloy components, we simply check that database. We then need to download that data to make sure we're getting the ASA Abloy list. So we just hit the download button. It takes um, sort of 
four to five seconds because it's quite a large database. Um, however, if you're updating all of them, if you if you selected a hundred objects and hit that button, it's still only four to five seconds. It doesn't compound. Okay, so now here you can see the content that we've got from our satellite. We've got a whole series of their revolving doors. I've actually got a way to see this better. If we click this plus button, you can see the assay blue content here. So we've got a series of their revolving doors. Can you just pick one of them and let's see it reconfigure well, in the... If we just pick the R23100, go back to um, component catalogs and assemblies. That's not, sorry, give me a second. Okay, catalogs and assemblies. Go to Asa Abloy, download. So where this is going is that manufacturers will be able to have their doors and windows in this system. You'll be able to select a particular one from the catalog and you'll have an exact replica, you know, exact model of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, is this are, are those considered doors instead of windows? And you're in the window tool. Is that yeah? Part they of are. That's that's kind of where I'm having problems. So I'll just show you here. This is this is my muck around um, project where I do all my coding. I'll just take you to um, let me see. Is that a door? Is that a door? Let's have a look at this one. So I can select this element. And go into so this is the asset it's got our tablet stuff in here already um i just go to my rd3 2100 and there you can see it's changed i, I need to download the data because these have changed databases have changed in here based on this setting so i just need to re refresh that data to make sure it's getting all the different components of that element because this um this revolving door is actually made up of several different components within here, including the um, the, the encasement, there's a, a door panel in the middle, there's the head unit, um, all these profiles as well. And just click OK. And you can see that element is now the Asta Abloy revolving door. Um, I can then also go back into that and I can go back to my uh, generic database, download the latest from there, and I'll just choose this laundry door. So I've configured a few standards within the part. Um, I do plan on doing a lot more of these to make things a lot easier for people, uh, but there, there are a few already here. So I just click on this laundry door, re import my databases. It's got a door, it's got the door seal on it there. When you do the revolving doors, they've got a door seal. So the door panel actually has a seal element. Um, so that's that's still showing up. I can go into that just by going to the door panel, which is a bit further up. There we go, door panel. And I'll turn that seal off. So, so you can see I can very quickly change from anything from a, a laundry door into a a manufacturer's complex component that's a completely different assembly type um, and that's that's sort of basically the efficiency of, of being able to change elements and, and all that sort of thing in you know arcad setting frames um, it's oh. the same with all of these i can i can set these panels haven't yet been set to this standard so i can go into this element and i can go to my um, door panels go to the database and I don't yet have that um, casement one in here because I need to download it. So I'll download the latest database, then there's that casement. So I can now go and set all these windows, all these operable elements to that casement panel that I, I configured earlier. So uh, Christian, we didn't practice this ahead of time, but uh, I'm gonna give you two custom parts that uh, you can say, hey, I can do that easily, or uh, no, I'm gonna have to work on that. So one would be a Dutch door, um, uh, where you've got a, a, you know, the upper part can swing independently of the lower part. Yes. Um, and the other the other would be a multi-panel one that slide, you know, maybe 
divides up and, and it actually has, uh, or, or it all, let's just try something more, more uh, non-standard in the library, you know, like six panels that all slide over to the side. Um, sure. Yep. Uh, because okay. that's, people often ask me, how do you do these, uh, you know, the uh, manufacturer here is called Nanowall, I think. Um, yes, I've heard of that. Yeah, so um, that, that would be cool. You, obviously, you don't have it in here right now. How would you create one of those? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll use the door tool rather than these windows that are placed over here. So I'll just come to a door. I'll do that Dutch door one first. So this is just a double, this is my double entry door. This actually came up the other week, um, fortunately. <laughs> so I, I do know how to do this. Um, but uh, there is not a panel type. If you go into the operable element, so I'll just go down here. These are all, all the different operable elements. If I click on that element, it takes me to my operable elements page. Let me just bring this over. And I've kept the interfaces um, to the standard size in this one as well. That makes things a little bit easier to navigate. And you can move this just up a bit. You can move, you can shift the UI around as well for when it gets large. So there's a whole series of different panel types available to you, opening operable types. Um, you got fixed, you got slight single sliders, you got um, sliders of different configurations, awnings, pivots, um, single hung and double hungs. You've got louvers, vertical and horizontal louvers, multifold doors, pretty much everything you need. But there is no Dutch door in there. So there isn't a door panel that does the separate. So I'll show you how we do that. All right. First thing we want to do is we'll just make this a single panel door. Door swing single. Okay, now um, that gets us part way there. We've got to split this. So if we go into our panel arrangement, if I go back to component catalogs, you can see panel arrangement is here. You click on the panel arrangement. This is where you nominate the mullions and transoms. So I'm just going to do two rows. Okay. So that's going to split the door in two. Now there's usually a a transom that goes through there. Let me just expand this so you can see it a bit more. Okay, so that's just that transom that I've turned on and off. Okay, so if we have a look at that in 3D, we've now got a short door with, with a transom across there, which is not um, precisely what we want. So we're gonna go in here, we're gonna turn that off. And now when we go to our operable elements, we've got a second one above. So we can just set that to a door swing as well. Door swing single and click OK. And that's kind of your Dutch doors, but they are not, um, they're not swinging in the exact same direction. Let's just check our standards, three symbols standard. Take it for this one, 3D symbol standard and click OK. And there is effectively the, the Dutch door. I'm just going to jump so in. So you should be able to swing open, you know, the upper part. Yeah, so you can then, I've just locked that. So that's sort of disappeared. Um, so if I unlock that, I'll just set this to 10 to start with. So then you get these little nodes here and that allows you to open up the upper part and leave the lower part closed. Or you can open up the part as well. Okay. Um, what does the symbol look like on the plan? On plan, it just looks like a standard door. So okay. is, that something, is, that something that, is that something that you've worked on in terms of just uh, giving some flexibility for the symbol, because I'm not quite sure what would be uh, appropriate, possibly having two, having two leaves, two. you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's something I've got to look into that. That's something that we change a lot. You can see here, these are these are awning windows. And so that's a symbol I've put into awning. People are always asking for specific symbols. I've actually um, can set up a different type. So we've got symbol on and off here. Um, and there is an option that when you're looking at the element, so if I go to the 2D and 3D settings, you can choose what row you look at. 
So if you've got a complex assembly that's got several rows, but all, all your operable elements are on the bottom row, then you'll want to look at row one. Um, if row one is kind of an insignificant row and all your operable elements are on the second row, then you, you change that to row two. So if I change that to row two, click OK. Obviously, you get the same thing because they're both just doors above and below. Although it is showing both of them. Yeah, that's interesting. Okay, okay that's actually a mistake. <laughs> um, it's, it must still be showing everything on row one, even though I've selected row two as well. Uh, but that's something that can be easily. Okay, well, that would be interesting to get some uh, feedback from architects as to uh, what would be preferred. Now, yeah. uh, what about doing a, uh, a, a banana, you know, multifold, uh, you know, in the standard library, sure. there might be like two, three, four, but sometimes these are going to have six or, or more right. for a big let's space. Go, let's go back to the 3D because it's all, always a lot more fun to work in 3D. Mm -hmm. And so, by the way, uh, all of you who are watching, if you have a favorite type of door or window that's been hard to do, uh, feel free to just uh, type it in. We do have another question from um, Chris Iliff, uh saying, North America windows with nailing flanges are common. Can this be created with infinite opening? So, you know, we'll cue that up. Let's do the, uh, the, the multi-panel one. Okay, so I'll do it here in this window. Um, because it's already set up in that door there, so there's not much to change. Uh, basically, all you do is go to the Operable Elements page. Okay, so this has uh, three elements. We want to we want to change this to one. So let's go back to our panel arrangements page, and we will set this back to a single column. And back to the operable elements and select our multifold. So we've got a, a multifold window, and we've also got uh, further down, we've got uh, these are multi sliding doors, and there's a, there's a multifold door down there. So they both work the same. So I'll just show you it with the window. Once you've selected it, you basically have this section over here where you nominate how many panels on either side. So if we mm -hmm. wanted, um, the example was six on one side and zero on the other. There's your element. You also have the ability to actually differ the widths and styles of each panel in this. So I can check this box and I can make this 600 and you can see it reduces the last one. So I could have like alternating widths with something that probably no one's going to really want to need. It was actually made for a different purpose. Um, but you can see that the object is quite flexible into how that all works. I'll just uncheck that and get it back to normal. Show you that in 3D. So that's the element in 3D. Uh, there should be a hotspot for moving that. It locked, that's why there's no hotspot. When you lock that um, 2D and 3D position, the hotspots disappear. So there's a hotspot in a bit of a funny spot. So Okay, I probably need to adjust the hotspot for this element, but you can see how you can open and close it. Looks like it's still using a um, a pivot hotspot based on the percentage. So you could open it to 100%. So that's them all stacking to one side. If you go in and have a look at that element, you can also choose where they sit within that frame. So there's lots of options for, um, the, the positioning, whether it's internal, external or, or manual. And then you can type in your positioning of how the elements sit in the frame. So you, you can really control the movement and positioning of these elements. Um, if we go back out to that, there's another option if, if this was a, a sliding element, we go to the multi-sliding, multi-sliding door. You have the option to have the first panel fixed or operable. So if we had that as fixed, then when we close the elements, open them 100%, sorry, that should be, they all open and stack over that first one. 
Whereas if that element was not fixed and it was also a movable element, then they're all going to actually move across to the side. And this is where you'd probably use more of a, of a face slider configuration. So um, the stacking and moving of, of different sliding and, and um, multifold elements has been a, a key focus for this part. So I'm pretty sure we've got them all, all sorted out really well. There's also um, within those elements, there's a subframe. So each um, operable element has its own uh, subframe, opening subframe. So uh, opening one has its own subframe on an early page. That's right, it's a sliding door. So this is a sliding door subframe. So you can see we've got the, the channels for it to slide and the different um, pieces of element that are like architraves and, and stuff on the outside as well. Um, so you can really configure your, your cavity sliders um, with the internal wall frames and all those sorts of things really well. It, it's had to be like that because um, I'm setting it up to take on obviously manufacturer's data and the manufacturer's data is, is quite specific. So we need to have all these components available. Mm -hmm. So there are some additional questions uh, here. Um, Dan Wyckoff says, do you plan on extruding each manufacturer's profiles? So instead of downloading individual details, I can just place a detail cut. Do you plan on including all accessory components such as trim and sill receivers? Um, at the moment, the, the accessory one's an easy one. Uh, it's sort of, it depends on um, what's required as it's requested. At the moment, the, the minor accessories are not being requested. For instance, even on the revolving doors, they've got certain detectors and, and cameras and things that are mounted on the pelmets and that. Um, that stuff is not being requested. So it's kind of a, it's kind of based on demand. If we have people asking for it because they want to quant quantify it, they want to visualize it, then we will make sure that the manufacturers um, provide that information so we can put it in. So yes, um, definitely. Um, sorry, what was the first part of that question? I'll read it again. <clears throat> Do you plan on ex uh, extruding each manufacturer's profile? So instead of downloading individual details, I can just place a detail cut. So, yes, that's that's correct. Um, if we have a look, I'll go back to that. Um, I am definitely doing the the manufacturer's profiles. There is a limitation um, into how far I take that. So let's just have a look at this in two D. So that's the manufacturer's profile there. Now that covers um, the the external aspect of the manufacturer's profile. I'm not putting in all that internal detail, but how that actually, how that profile relates to other elements around um, and that sort of thing. Yes, the the profiles each manufacturer's profiles for each of their components. So this is this is their specific profile for the styles of their door. And this is their specific profile for the door seal that is included. Um, it's that's not really much of a profile, but uh, all, all those sorts of things. There's also in this element there are right, mid rail options. Um, if you customize this one, go to custom, and then we come down to uh, this element here. We can change that. Going up. Okay, so this is the RD3. We can change it to the RD3 mid rail, and that gives us a mid rail in there as well. And the profile of that mid rail is also set to um, the manufacturers. So what we do with this, and this is what impresses the manufacturers, is we basically take their drawing. We 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 bring them into ARCAD, DWG. I put this object on top of it and, and I trace it. So if I show you how that's done, um, we'll just do it with a frame here. Uh, so if I go into my uh, frame component, this occurs with the door styles and all those sorts of things as well, but the frame is just probably the easiest one to show that with. This is locked, so I'm gonna unlock that. So that's locked to a, that was a 90 by 40 frame. I've got several other ones in there. And you can see I've also got some interesting profiles in there. So if I unlock that, 
then I set my frame type to polygon and then I set my mullions because there's lots of different, I'm sorry, not mullions, my hotspots. There's lots of different hotspots for different purposes in this object because of the things that you need to be able to manipulate. So um, to change this, we want to change it, set it to profile guides, click OK. Then you can see I get a series of hotspots around here. So I would basically drop the manufacturer's detail there and then I would use these hotspots to follow that element. So I can um, move nodes around, I can add nodes in, and I can put different curves on those elements as well. So I can basically trace the manufacturer's profile like that, go back into my settings and store this as um, manufacturer 01 profile 01 or something, or manufacturer profile, doesn't really matter what I call it in this instance. So I can just leave it as that, hit the upload. You can see that it's not there quite yet. Hit the download, and there it is. So now the element is locked to that profile. So okay. now I can switch between. May I step in for a moment? Sure. So the this upload and download thing, I'm just going to explain from my perspective, and you can clar clarify if I have it wrong. Mm -hmm. So one of there's I'd say two parts of what you're doing that's really exciting. One is you have a tool in this case doors and windows but i know you also do cabinets and uh, other uh, other yeah. ones that is extremely flexible so it can represent geometry in ways yeah. that are far more intricate and intuitive like we're seeing here just grab hot spots etc um to uh, you know to change the profiles uh so that's one thing and then the other is that any configuration you create either for a custom design or that needs to be done for a manufacturer can be saved as a favorite, but this is not just a normal favorite. This is a database entry. Mm -hmm. And so by uploading what has been created, and of course this is just sort of a quick demonstration, but you upload something, it then gets put into the database, then yes. bring it back down. And maybe one of the interface changes you can do is, is have a combined button that says upload and refresh the database or something like that. Yeah. That would be convenient. Uh, but that's a minor thing. Basically, mm -hmm. now it's in that pop-up list, and yeah. it's a linked item. So if you later realize, oh, that's not quite right, or we want to add more detail or something like that, you can redefine it to make it more accurate. Or, yeah. or if it is a custom sort of situation, you can redefine it based on your design choice. You know, let's mm -hmm. make this a little different. And then every single one in that 10,000, you know, components in Queen's Wharf could be affected. Obviously, they're gonna be. Right. You know, um, so uh, there are um, some other ones that, you know, I think people are asking, you know, saying, can you do, for example, five sliding panels into a framed pocket like Fleetwood? So. Uh, um, sure. Um, five into a framed pocket. Yes, I can. <laughs> um, let me just do that for you. I'll just quickly grab the door. I'll start from scratch, the infinite door. I'm not sure why it's set to that at the moment. Um, and I'll go and see, I don't know if I've done any customs yet for, I'm just checking to see if I did any pocket sliders as standards because I know someone was asking for that. Okay, no, I haven't. So what I'm going to do is I'll just start with this one as it is. Um, I'll go into my operable elements. And I will change this. I might change the configuration first. Let's go to the panel arrangement and just get this down to a single. Now let's go into the operable elements. There's a head track. That element there is 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 the head track. Um, so I'm just going to go and I'll turn that off for now. Okay, I'll go to um, probable elements and we want a multi sliding. Let's go find our cavity slider though, because this is a specific one. Uh, face slider, cavity slide. So that's the door cavity slide. 
Um, we're generally not going to want the first one fixed. Let's do a zero on one side and five on the other side. Was that the configuration? We can do it. Sounds, it doesn't like, really sounds like it. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really matter because we can do it any side. Um, make it much bigger. You know, make it at least wider so we can. Yeah, sure. See it and then show its manipulation, how it how it slides. Um, okay. Um, now there's a sliding door frame setup. So I'm just going to turn these on um, because what you typically do in a cavity, this is you're not going to rely on this main frame, this main structure frame of the element. So we'd actually go into that element, go into the frame, the main frame, and we'd turn this off. There's one that I've set here to off. So that basically is setting these values to zero. So then when I go into my operable element and I go to the sliding door, I can turn on all these frames. So we've got the channel, goes in the head, the cavity, and these are the different elements that go on in different spots of the egress. If I just turn these all on, Okay, so these, this is the little detail you get down here of um, where those elements sit and you can extend cavities and things like that. Okay, so if I now just click OK and I'll place this element. Let's go place it and just delete this one, get this one out of the way. Place that element there. And now you can see this is the hotspot for moving them. So in 2D, they all slide into that cavity. Bring this down 90%, 100%. So that's them all neatly tucked in the cavity. There's a very thin door that's set as a glass door. If we have a look at that in um, 3D, and we'll grab this node. And we'll slide them into the cavity. Doesn't like when you get to 100%, it seems to always revert back to zero. So you can see they're all tucked away in the cavity nicely there. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, if we change the size of those elements, bear with me for a second while I change my door panel to something a little bit more normal. Let's just see if I've got something saved here, not the SR boy ones. Just a framed glass. Okay, so that's a more normal. We've got a thickness there of 40 for our door panel, glass of eight, and these are our um, stiles and rails. Click OK. And you see that automatically adjusts the size of the actual cut cavity in there in 3D. All right, well, that, that's great. I, I'll see um, if Keihaku has any comments there. Um, yeah, he says, yup. <laughs> so great. Yeah, um, that's how it works. Yeah. Yeah, look, it's all quite all these all the standard things that you would expect to do. I've done them, or I haven't. I, so it hasn't been mentioned yet. Um, but this is all comes down to the capabilities of GDL and and XML and the the array functions within GDL. You know, we can we can do whatever. Um, if you can perceive logic of geometry, mm -hmm. then we can put it in GDL. So whatever you can think about can can be done. Um, and that's kind of what I wanted to do. You, uh, Eric, you really hit the nail on the head when you're sort of summarising what was going going on with this whole concept. Is you, I've created something that is extremely flexible in the geometry. That that's the first part, um, and and the main part, having to create something that can basically assume any geometry that you're going to want it to assume, any of the configurations that you'll want it to do. This part can do things that are really not supposed to be done but the flexibility needs to be there um, to allow people to play around with different ideas. So yeah. that was the number one thing. And it's really exciting to be able to do that in GDL with their arrays, which are, I mean, if you're talking a bit technical, they're, they're a dynamic element that can, that can change the number of values in it in rows and columns. Now they've added dictionaries. We've got three dimensional arrays. So we've got a, you know, the amount of, the amount that that element can organically expand and contract as you adjust what you want in your object is is phenomenal. And that's what's happening here. Every time I add another door panel, one of those arrays is growing. Every time I take a door panel away, that array is shrinking. Um, 
it's the same with the profiles. When I add nodes into all the profiles, the array is growing and shrinking depending on how I'm manipulating those hotspots. The fact that we have that ability within GDL and the fact that we have GDL within Archicad is a real, um, you know, it's a, it's one of its real strengths. And I think it's mm -hmm. un, underexploited. So that's why I'm trying to create these parts and make it easier for everyone to explore. Yeah. So we have two questions related to management and sort of working with it beyond the geometry. So one is how big are the objects? Um, so- you know, As in file size? Uh, yeah, that's, um, I'll show you that because if I told you the total file, it's, it's not very attractive. Um, where are we? Component catalogs, so these are our component catalogs. So these are the standard objects that you place. This is the curtain, it's a door and a window. There's a skylight one and there's also a curtain wall panel. So you have all this functionality in curtain wall panels and skylights as well. Um, they're relatively small objects. I don't even know why that one's 706. So they're 435, but the total file, uh, if we go, well, the main macro, and this is the largest macro I've ever done, um, is, is 2,500 kilobytes so you know two and a half megabytes two so, and a half, yeah it's it's pretty big for a gdl object but it's still fairly manageable well you you could almost fit that on a floppy disk right yeah uh, that's right yeah <laughs> yeah you know, so we're, we're talking about something that is very uh, compact code yeah. and one of the things that occurred to me i was t telling you this christian but i wanted to share it with everybody you know before there were drawings, there was there were verbal instructions. You know, like even you go back to the Bible and the Ark. You know, make something so many cubits long or or whatever. So there was a description. You know, do it this way. Um, or the Greek temples. You know, um, the the verbal description. Well, yeah. you can sort of think like GDL uh, is a verbal description of how to build something. Now, yes. because uh you know a talented person like christian has set up the interpretation of it you then essentially just type in some values here or there or pick from pop-ups mm. now your effort to type in values or pick from pop-ups that's all that has to be recorded in what we call the xml file so xml is just a special type of text file yes. that's written in a way that computers can easily see all the data. Um, it's yeah. not paragraphs and copy, but yeah, so here uh, on the side. Um, yeah. So in any event, it, it's, a, it's a description of how to build it. Now, why this is particularly fascinating is the technology, as we all know, we've, you know, if you've been in computers for any length of time, you know, they went from, I literally, when I was a kid, worked with, uh, with my brother, who was a computer scientist, with paper tape. Then it became magnetic tape. Then yeah. it became disks, um, hard disks, big hard disks, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And then it became smaller and it became optical with CDs. And then it mm -hmm. became, you know, solid state drives and all of that. Now that keeps evolving. But if you think about the instructions that say make geometry in this way, that can be put on any medium. And mm -hmm. so when the Queen's Wharf people are saying uh, their requirement is, to make sure that all of the data for this project all of the design drawings and documentation etc is accessible for the next 99 years they had to look at technology like archicad and like gdl that basically is symbolic and yes. you know we can we can assume that 99 years from now there'll be archicad 120 uh you know 122 or whatever um perhaps but uh even if there wasn't even if archicad wasn't there the fact that the data is um you know in this sort of description is uh, so powerful uh yeah, so in, that, yeah go ahead that that's a massive thing that's why i wanted to stop you that that is a huge deal and it's something that we're facing right now on queen's wharf as a as a big roadblock at the moment because um they want to obviously as like you said as things evolve their requirements will evolve as well so they have certain requirements of this part now um I've, I've reached some limits in this part. I found a lot about the limits of GDL. These are these are defined limits that Graphsoft put in to keep things safe. But 1,024 parameters is all you're allowed to have, or you can fit in an object. I've reached that limit, and then 
and basically had to consolidate a whole bunch of those parameters in order to add more things. Um, in doing that, they basically, you know, we wrote, okay, now every time you run updates, like if you've migrated a project through it, different versions of Archicad, what are you going to lose? What's going to fall out? When you update library parts with new library parts, what's missing, what changes and all, all that sort of thing. It, it's a massive concern. However, this whole functionality with the XMLs, and as you said, storing this data, this description in the XML, it basically improves its longevity. So if what they've done now, they, go, they have to go through their parts and go, the components that are not defined by a component catalog, defined by an XML, they need to set them into an XML. Because what that means is that no matter how I update my object, whether I remove parameters, completely change functions around altogether, as long as it still reads and interprets those XML files in a way that they want, then there's no problems with updates anymore. Yeah. So what yeah. they have now, because they have they've gone through Queen's Wharf and they've locked everything down to component catalogs, every setting of the tools is locked down to component catalogs, including the 2D and 3D representation. They now know that whenever I update the tool, it's a seamless transition. They don't even, they don't have to think about it. They don't have to check it. It just you know, and on a project of that size with 10,000 plus instances of the element, to be able to just reload the latest library to have access to the latest advancements in that library is a, a massive win for them. They're already going through processes where they've got to manage these changes for other elements. They're just really excited that as far as ARCHICAD libraries are using these features, they don't have to worry about it there. Yeah. So that's a, that's a massive windfall as far as resources on, on just maintaining elements and, and keeping things as modern as possible. So, um... One more technical question, then I want to make sure we explain to people how they can get access to your infinite openings uh, at no charge. So uh, there's a question from Richard Hewitt saying, do you have your own scheduling sheets to do a window schedule or do you rely on the Archicad system? That's a, that's a great question. Um, and unfortunately, I rely on the Archicad system. <laughs> so uh, it's something that I've worked on. It's, it's a pain point for a lot of people. Uh, in fact, the reason I first created a window and door tool that was capable of all these geometry, this geometry is so that you could schedule properly, at least, you know, as far as one component is made up of one object instead of one window assembly being made up of four pieces stitched together. Um, there was a, um, there was a client of mine in America, who I won't mention their name right now because I'm not sure how happy they are about that, but they're probably fine with it, um, who uses this tool. And they basically went through a project and said that they, they had, uh, I think it was um, 36 uh, window elements. And um, it was built up out of 81 instances of the window, of the ARCAD window tools. When they implemented this object, it became 36 elements for 36 windows, and that was it. So they could schedule. However, the parameters and the values that you schedule, most of these parameters and values are locked in arrays, and arrays cannot be scheduled in the dynamic schedules, um, interactive schedules. So what I've had to do is I've had to create other dummy values to then store the data of that array so that you could schedule it. Um, the other thing that I definitely do do is I make sure that I use the same parameter naming as Graphisoft so that the, the values you're used to scheduling out of the Graphisoft standard parts, you'll still be able to schedule out of this part as well. Mm -hmm. So, so um, the short answer is you're using the standard ARCHICAD scheduling or the standard ARCHICAD scheduling will work nicely with these parts. Yep. You have the benefit that things that in the standard environment might have to be done by ganging multiple pieces together. That's it right. looks good, but it won't be a single element in the schedule, even though you might order it from the manufacturer as a single element and you want it to be a single element in the schedule. Well, here you can have this complex arrangement as a single um, component. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and you've done some technical stuff to take the data from arrays into parameters, but ultimately from the user point of view, you can mix this in, you can integrate it into a project that's using standard Graphisoft parts yeah. and know that it will schedule. Now, this is different than something like, I believe CAD Image has, you know, 
pretty sophisticated window and door tool. I don't think it's nearly as flexible as this. And they do have their own scheduling, That's which, right. you know, um, is a mixed thing because on the one hand, in order to use their stuff, you have to use that schedule, but that means you have to use all their stuff or not. Um, exactly. And um, and uh, they don't necessarily keep it in sync with Graphisoft. I mean, they do a good job in general of updating every year, but uh, this fitting into the overall standard environment, I think is a real benefit. So um, I know there's gonna be some more questions and, and a few more things to demonstrate, including one person asked about your cabinets, um, mm -hmm. saying, you know, they're amazingly flexible and can we see that, but how would people get access to the infinite openings and why are we giving them away so can you show the page um yeah sure the, uh, mm -hmm. um uh here we go so this is the if you when you come to the kate swift website um you just come to this page i'm, I'm pretty sure everyone knows that image um it's uh, a <laughs> it would have been nice to get it at a higher resolution but still um then these are just sort of some quick grabs of of what's available, but you can just go to the shop and that's where you can see all the objects. Um, and if you scroll down, you see the infinite openings right here. So if you want to purchase, if you want to access this for free, you simply add that to your cart um, and then you go through the proceed to checkout. And uh, I won't put all that stuff in there. There's a, there's a third step. Let's go continue. Oh, I don't know. I don't remember the password. Okay. There is a third I, I, verified that, I verified that it worked before, uh, be, just before the, the webinar. So when you yeah, get to so, the third step, you put in a code. Yeah, so you go to the next step um, and there's a code. There's an option there to put in the code. And that code is just Bobro 2020. So um, I'll just write that. On screen it's Bobro with a capital B. I don't know why I'm using word, but anyway. So the password is simply Bobro2020. Okay. A Just secret like the secret password. So the basically password. You, you set up your account you know, just with a name and email. You put in some other uh, information, but you don't have to put in a credit card. And then no where it would normally take a credit card you put in that code and it says 100 percent discount zero dollars and then you can go and complete the transaction without paying christian anything now why are you doing this christian let's let's go over where where are you going with this okay well look the the real reason why i'm doing this is um because i i think that these sorts of developments um, are better funded by the manufacturers. Um, I, I don't think it's, it's um, you know, ArchiCAD is a really powerful tool uh, and you already pay a, a good amount of that per year. And I think these third party tools should be funded in a different, in a different way. So I would like everyone to get on and start using this process and start um, accessing manufacturers data through that. And the more people that are using the tool, the more the manufacturers are willing to, um, you know, throw their hat in the ring. So it, it's kind of the chicken before the egg thing. If I try and get manufacturers on board so that you have a good reason for jumping onto this tool, um, manufacturers are, don't have enough incentive because obviously um, within America, there's just not a significant amount of people using the tool. So if you all have free access to it, um, then that makes it a lot more enticing for the manufacturers to to chime in and, and start funding the tool. Right. So, uh, yeah, I really, I will, you know, promote this actively to, uh, you know, make sure that ArchiCAD users are aware of this opportunity. Um, I think it's fantastic uh, that you're thinking long term, big picture, um, instead of saying, I, I just want to get more sales, uh, you know, two hundred dollars a piece or two forty eight Australian. Um, so uh, where you're going with all your tools, I think this is this one is is the one you're sort of focusing on at the moment and that we're sharing today. Uh, but you're expecting that down the line, sort of your whole library will yeah. move into that model. Definitely, this is the model that I'm trying to establish. So um, the 
I am mainly focusing on this tool because I want to get it perfect. Um, there's been a lot of redefining of how that the whole process works with the communication with XML files. Um, we did have some um, some speed issues at some point, uh, and then updating we had massive delays of like two hours and things like that. So I had to completely change the way that works in the back end. Also updating the interface and all that. You know, I'm getting a lot more feedback on how that works. Uh, so I want to get the one tool, you know, as fairly close to perfect as possible, which it's almost at that stage now anyway. Um, and then I'll move on and, and put the whole same interface and same functionality throughout all the tools. Right, okay. okay. Well, um, that is great that th we can share this and I can help you and all of you who are on this call or watching the recording will be able to help this effort so you can do good by doing good for yourself, you know, getting a very powerful tool. Um, so do you have a, an instruction manual? Because, you know, that interface was a little bit confusing, even for me. Look, you know, this is, this is one of the, the parts where I've been a bit slack on. There are videos on YouTube, um, but they're not, most of them are also, you know, maybe even six months old and the interface has changed since then. So I do need to put up some more videos um, on instructions, but at the moment it's kind of basically as you're sort of going through the process, if you're having problems, just get in touch with me, send me an email and I'll respond straight away. The, the aim for this is it's been difficult for me in the past to be able to support all my customers while I also try and do project work. And that's why this sort of model is changing that um, where the manufacturer subscribes because what we're getting, we're giving a lot more back to the manufacturer as well with this process. And what that's doing is it's freeing up my time so I can spend my time 100% on development and support. Um, so as you sort of battle through for the first couple of weeks, just feel free to give me a call um, or, or shoot me an email. Uh, I'll send you links to the, anyone who wants, I'll send links to the, the YouTube videos. Um, if you go to the YouTube, YouTube channel, you want to just... Yeah, YouTube yeah. channel, CAD Swift. Um, so if you just type in CAD Swift, it should pop up and there it is. So that's the YouTube channel. Um, there's a few playlists. So if we go to the playlist, it's probably the easiest place to go. So there's a playlist here on the infinite ceilings and this is the one on the infinite openings. And it takes you through a, a lot of um, the processes. So there are obviously videos that are old. So this one is done in 2017. This was the initial one. This is when I first got got it finished and, and was releasing it um, with all the new functions. But there's, there's lots more. So there's the component catalogs one. And this takes you through how to use component catalogs, how they work. Um, however, the interface you see there will be different. So some of the processes will be will look a lot less efficient in the video than what they are currently in the in the latest version of the part, um, but the logic is still all there. Right, okay. So we're gonna get you a lot more views on these. I can see you have 117 yeah, views. Um, yeah. so That'll encourage me to do a lot more videos as well. So, you know, it's <laughs> always, always that response. Right, okay. Um, <clears throat> so a few other questions. How far back uh, is this compatible to? What, ver in terms of ARCAD versions, is it only 23? Does it go back earlier? What? No, 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 19. Um, you might, might have noticed here, this is my sort of working file. This is an ARCAD 19 file. So everything is still, I'm still scripting everything in ARCAD 19, which is, uh, I'm looking to move to 21 pretty soon because I want to start using some of the added um, functionalities in GDL, um, namely the complex profiles and, um, and other things like that. And there's also some more intelligent processes. I will be, um, doing at the moment it's an ARCAD 19 that is version, which you can just read obviously in successive versions, but I will start following more Graphisoft leads where I've got an ARCAD, you know, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24 version. And then you use the library migration and, and that to, to work out the compatibility between things. It's been difficult for me to do that at the moment, but Graphisoft have made some huge advancements in macros that they've made available to sort of really improve that process. So um, there will be specific versions for platforms in the future. Um, and that means I'll be able to exploit all the latest advancements in GDL. Great, that's great. 
Um, let's see. So a general question from Michael Gord Silas saying, what's the best way to learn GDL and XML? And I'm just going to throw out a couple of things for you and then you can elaborate, Christian. So uh, the classic learning tool for GDL is a book that used to be in print and I think you can still get it digitally called the GDL Cookbook by okay. David Nicholson Cole, who is uh, a, a British <clears throat> um, <clears throat> British uh, educator, I would say. I mean, I, I think, I'm not sure if he's an architect actually. I know he uh, teaches or has taught at Nottingham University. And so it's a, it's a very, I actually have it in my bookcase. Um, and it's a cookbook. It's saying, how would you script you know, mm -hmm. this plus or this column or this chair or this cabinet or whatever, and it takes you through learning recipes. Um, and so it's great. Now it's it's an old book. It, it dates back to maybe Arcade 8 or something like that, but uh, still GDL, the code from old versions still works. And so aside from um, some of the more recent things about the visual interface, which I think maybe isn't covered in, in that classic book, um, you know, it's a good reference. There's also a, uh, a course that uh, I had uh, sort of pr produced as part of the Masters of Archicad series by uh, another British um, gentleman uh, named Gary Laws. Uh, and he is in practice as a designer. I'm not sure if he's an architect. I think he's an architectural technologist. Um, mm -hmm. but Gary Laws created something called, we called Practical Parametric GDL. Uh, so basically, how can you learn the basic things that are going to give you benefit rather than becoming a rocket scientist or a GDL programmer? How can you, as an ARCHICAD user, just learn the key things that are going to make it easier to uh, do what you need? So that course is available through Masters of ARCHICAD. Um, and if you contact me, uh, support at bobro.com, I can send you a link to uh, where you can sign up. Now, uh, XML is a general programming tool. You use it, you learn it in context. You don't learn XML by well. um, Yeah. So, Christian, do you have any other things in terms of someone who wants to, you know, get their hands on this? Uh, Look, beyond I'll, I'll, just re I'll just reiterate what you've said pretty much because it's really, there's really not a lot out there available. I learned by reading the GDL reference guide um, and trial and error, and it's very hard to learn that way. It takes a lot of time. Um, not all the information is in the reference guide. So if you if you want to learn that way, um, it may be helpful with some things, but you're going to get some weird results and you, it's going to be hard to understand why you're getting those weird results. The David Nicholson Cole book, um, although I've never, um, I don't own it, I have read it, I read parts of it. Um, I'm in touch with David uh, over the years from time to time. Um, and it's, it, it's a really great resource uh, because he he goes to the extent of um, talking about the value of arrays. So I'll just I'll just quickly open an object and show you what I mean. It only take a couple of seconds. Um, but these arrays are basically what you know governs all the flexibility in the um, so where so this is an array, okay. So this is a standard parameter. It's just a single value. This is an array where you've checked that and it's a series of values. Uh, and that array is dynamic, so it can expand and shrink based on how the part is being used. Uh, in David Nich Nicholson's Cole book, he stipulates how important arrays are for you know really getting a, a lot of parametrics into a part. So I think that's a great resource. Um, and I also think the, the other, um, the webinar that you mentioned as well, Eric, is is another great resource um, to sort of start to, it's a good place to start to work out, out you know, what you might be able to control um, and how to easily get access to that. Once you start with GDL, it's kind of, it's a natural progression. It's quite easy to learn, but you need to sort of take baby steps. Otherwise it can be very confusing. Right. So let me just read some other comments here. So. Um... Uh, Keihaku, who is the one who asked about the sliding, pa uh, the slider panels into the pocket, has already mm -hmm. gone, downloaded it. It worked. The you know the the discount code to take it to free, and I'm running right. it now, and uh, so that's great. Uh, Steve Pribble asked, yeah. "Is the manual?" We went over that. So no manual. There are some videos, and you know, so that's uh, something 
you'd have to go through the videos to understand. Um, neural or health may as well. Yeah, yeah. or or contact uh, Christian. Um, Gerald Hoffman says, are there updates to your tools which we could download as you refine them? Um, are you going to be, do you have an email list that you keep in touch with people who have downloaded? I do, I do have an email list. Um, I, I don't use it as regularly as I should. You'd probably be disgusted in the way I use it, Eric, because I'm sure you're a lot better than me at that sort of thing. Um, I basically have a list of subscribers and whenever there's an update, I contact them directly through email. So I don't, I, which is a bit more of a slower, more inefficient way for someone who works on efficiencies. It's a really inefficient way to do things. Um, so I will change that. But if you if you're subscribed to the tool or user tool, even if you've got this free subscription and that, um, I will send you updates every time they they're generated. Um, mm -hmm. That can get a, a little annoying because sometimes I'll send you an update. You know, I might send two in one week, you know, and then a few more than the week after. So I, I try and keep it to a point where I know that I'm not going to do a little bit more work for a while. But there's also crucial things that people really want to get their hands on straight away, um, like the the accessibility stamps that are now incorporated into this element. You know, people are upgrading their updating everything just to get access to that sort of that function. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I do keep in touch and I, I make sure everyone is aware of what's coming, but at the moment it's not an automated system, it's a manual system that I use. It's, um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So, um, so Michael Ravichev says, what steps to take to get GDL elements into a project? Let me just answer that generally and then we can make sure we have it for you. <clears throat> so a GDL element can be a single library part or can be a collection of parts, a whole library you know, of resources and you typically in Archicad go to the file menu library and libraries and objects library manager um, and then load it. So you add either individual elements into your embedded library or you add a folder that has potentially multiple elements or a whole um, library container file. So once you've done that in library manager, then it will be available in <clears throat> the tools. In other words, when you go to the window tool or door tool, It'll be one of the options, just like you know, you're you see everything else. Um, is there anything special in terms of your uh, library other than loading it? No, it's exactly the same. Um, I one of the things I do is is keep all my stuff to just strict GDL objects. There's no add-ons or anything like that at the moment. So yeah, you just load it in the same way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Pablo says, can you repeat the procedure to obtain the library? So go back to your web browser to show people oh. uh, where that is. Go back to home uh, and we go to the shop and then we scroll down till we find infinite openings. We just click add to cart. I've got two items in there now. I'll just move, move that to one and update the quantity. It doesn't really matter. Um, and then click here to keep shopping or proceed to checkout. So you proceed to the checkout. Um, I'm just going to check out as a guest or you can register an account um, or you can log in before you actually do that so you can register an account and log in. Uh, if I check out as a guest and then hit continue, email address, I don't know why that's continue. Bill address, bill for this address, like that. And this is where you have a coupon code. So in the express checkout, this is the third step, type in the coupon code, Bobro2020, and hit apply. And you'll see that's giving you a 100% discount. Click yes, agree to terms and conditions, click to join the mailing list and and hit continue and your order is placed. So as you can see, like uh, Eric said, there's no need to put in a credit card or any of those sort, that sort of information. Um, you just name an email address and away you go. Okay, so there's a question from Grant saying, uh, the what we'd mentioned, what you told me was that you'd give this away for a year subscription. And mm -hmm. if uh, what happens at the end of one year? 
So at the end of the year, the way the tool works is it'll just lock. Um, so what that'll mean is every single parameter in the object locks and can no longer be edited. So it'll, the elements will stay within your project. Um, they will stay in their last latest configuration, latest settings, but you won't be able to edit, edit them any further and you won't be able to place new elements and edit them. And so what happens if someone wants to subscribe or you, uh, what if you switch over yeah. your model fully to have manufacturers um, pay for it? <clears throat> So if they want to subscribe, then obviously they just jump on here and um, renew their subscription. So you'll be registered in here as having a one year subscription, even though you haven't paid for it. And it'll just be a simple matter of going and renewing that subscription, uh, which is basically purchasing the part. Um, and then when you load that, everything in your project will unlock and it'll be back to full working order. However, as sort of Eric said, and as we've spoken of before, the idea is that we get the manufacturers to fund these elements. Um, it, there's a fair bit of work that goes into maintaining an object like this. So there's a reasonable amount of funding that is required, and, but we are part way there. And if that happens, then the part will be free ongoing. So um, if you really do enjoy the part and, and want to keep using it uh, without ever having to pay for it, then it's good to encourage some of your um, your suppliers to jump on board and, and and put their data into the object. Obviously, that'll also make things easier for you. And we've set up a we've set up a communication platform where you can actually send suppliers your XML descriptions, and they can read it and interrogate it and and put it into their estimating systems. So the, the manufacturer is going to get a lot out of this communication, being able to communicate with this XML data. So the manufacturers are really excited about it as well. So it's not like, you know, trying to get blood from a stone, which it used to be. The BIM is, in this way, BIM is now giving something back to the manufacturers and they're very excited about that communication. Okay, so right now, worst case scenario, <clears throat> if you like it, well, worst case scenario is you use it and then you stop using it. Um, next one would be use it and then pay another, another 248 Australian dollars uh, a year from now um, uh, to continue using it for another year. Is that right? Yes, that's correct. In the best case scenario, which uh, it sounds like there's a, a pretty decent chance that it will happen, is that uh, by that time you will have funding so that you'll be able to uh, keep at least the windows and doors um, for, for yeah. free for, forever. Um, now, can you show us uh, cabinets? Um, sure. Uh, there's a comment from uh, um, one of the uh, uh, John Dunham saying the cabinet tool is extremely flexible. Um, and by the way, Jerry, we have a comment that the state province code does not show on the website for registration. So I'm not quite sure if if you can't select it. Um, you know, so anyway, we'll have to look at that. We'll have to look into that. Okay. Okay, um, so the joinery tool, we just go to the object tool and it's in infinite by CASWIFT, infinite joinery, here it is. Um, so this this tool basically has the ability, if we go into general sizes, this is just sort of some sizing options for, for the bench and that um, and, and your height and your kick and all that sort of thing. So you can adjust all those those sizes. Um, there's different bench, bench tops. So we've got a standard, we better turn that bench top on and we might put a better thickness to it. Let's do 40 mil. Um, and then we've got your waterfall left and right and, um, and waterfall both. And there's also, this image is not really indicative of what this is, but there's also a freeform bench top. So if I click on the freeform, bench top. I'll just go place this, click OK, place the element. Uh, it doesn't look like I've got the bench top showing in 2D, so I'll need to go to my 2D settings and show the bench top. Click OK. So this is my bench top and you've noticed I did the free form. So this gives me those same hotspots that uh, are in the door frame and I can basically shape up whatever bench shape I want to using that. 
there's a there's a resolution control for that as well. So if we have a look at that in 3D, hopefully no one's doing a bench top of that shape because that's quite ugly. But um, you can see what it's capable of doing. If we go to the resolution control, I'm not sure which part this is reading at the moment. 2D, pump that up. No, that's, that must be reading one of the old parts. So there is a way to adjust that resolution. It's probably even still in the settings. Now I'll have to work out what resolution that's reading. But you can adjust the resolution of this arc so that it, it comes through a lot less um, segmented like that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, main, the main sort of thing that makes this um, element really capable is if I just turn that bench top off, I'll put it to something standard. Is the function arrangement. So you can have basically any rows or columns of functions in here. So uh, I've got three columns at the moment. Um, I'm going to set that. They're not set to the right size. They're not. They're not equal. That looks like there's only one there. I'll just click that. So now you can see all three. So the other two were like zero width or, or something like that. Um, I can set this to 12 if I wanted to. They're all equal. I'm running out of space, obviously, when I do something silly like that. I'll just make this a bit bigger. And then um, we can adjust the height as well. Let's do 2100 high. Oh no, that's the depth, sorry, height. Obviously you can adjust the depth as well. And then within this, I can start putting in um, multiple uh, rows as well. So if I set height greater than one, uh, if I set that to being equal and I divide this up by, let's just say four, you can now see on this section here, I've got four elements. Uh, I'll just place that, I'll show you in 3D because that's probably a pretty small window. I'm going to take that cut off. So you can see I've now got four elements. I can then go into any of these elements and I can define what they are. So these are the different heights. I've just got them all set to equal. Um, I can adjust the height of this a little bit as well. That just expands my UI, so it makes it a little bit easier to read. Uh, if I get rid of the set height, then I can control what these are. So I have a series of draw banks. I have different doors with handles in different positions. I've got a counterweight door in there. Um, bad door style. <laughs> that was not a good option. Uh, I'll have to work out why that's doing that. Um, <coughs> doors you can do shelf and rails you can do you can do recesses that's the wrong spot for a recess halfway up um, so that's why it's sending that panel up the top there uh, you can do a shelf and rail element and then those shelf and rails are set in here you've got the different shelf placements so you go into shelf and rail and that defines the different heights and positionings of those elements so what this object can do is that it can basically do any joinery configuration uh, that you can imagine from your kitchen joinery through to all your cupboard fit outs as well. So with the shelf and rail, you can have that shelf and rail, you know, butting into the side of drawers and other shelves and, and things like that. Um, so you can get some really uh, decent configurations out of this. It, yeah, that's- It's uh, designed to do all your joinery needs, basically. Okay, um, so uh, comment from John Dunham, tell everyone to get the infinite openings as well as the Swift joinery tools and they'll be able to do just about everything they will need as single practitioners in terms of cabinets, doors and windows. So mm -hmm. there you go, testimony from Excellent. one of your clients. Um, now, uh, there are some questions about compatibility things, what happens with archived files? Um, so, you know, I guess <clears throat> if you save a file, you know, your project is sort of put on hold or it's, it's been completed, you open it later. As you said, the, the parts will stay visible. Um, if you don't have an active subscription and if things haven't switched to the free model, um, then they would basically 
you wouldn't be able to edit them. You know, you could delete them and put yeah. something else in, but you wouldn't yeah. be able to re rework them. Yeah. Um, Jaime says, uh, I've downloaded library, but get a locked UI with a warning that your subscription has expired or are yet to activate. So is there something that they have to do to activate? Uh, yes, that's the that's the part that comes from um, the, the website. They need a, a current version of it. So that thing that comes on the website is, is deactivated. It's a security measure. Um, so I'll have to actually manually send out the, the, the activated part. So I've got a library set up uh, for you guys already. Um, going through the website basically just puts you on the list and, and lets me know where you come from. Um, and then I've got a library part that's set up, uh, ready to go, ready to send out, um, which I'll do shortly to everyone who's um, subscribed. And in that library, I've also included uh, sort of a two month, little two and a half month trial of pretty much every other tool within our range. So you'll have access to so, so they are giving you a year, a year of access to the door in Windows, and maybe forever if if it works out. Get forever, yes. yeah. Two and a half months uh, free access to all your other tools um, as well. Yeah, but yeah. but you have to fulfill it at this point. Um, it doesn't come automatically when people um, make that. No, purchase. it doesn't come automatically from that. The, that's a security measure. We had some issues with. You know, I was updating the parts on there all the time, and there were people downloading it just to crack the code and get inside my parts. So um, I don't put the latest part on the website anymore. Okay, all right. So yeah. wait, then within a what, like 24 hours from? You know, oh yeah, as, as soon as we get off this, I'll I'll go through the list of everyone. I can see them all coming through right now, popping up. Um, I'll go through <laughs> everyone who's um, purchased that. And I'll send them the library directly. If if anyone is uncomfortable of going going through that website for whatever reason, um, feel free to just send me an email. Just go to the contact list or something like that, the contact page, or send me an email or email directly. It's just Christian at cadswift.com.au, um, and or connect with me on LinkedIn and, and Twitter and things like that, and and communicate with me um, via email, and I'll I'll send you the parts out as well if you're not comfortable using the website. Okay, that, that sounds very uh, accommodating. So Sasha says, can we share our custom-made doors and windows using this tool and have them available for everyone like a worldwide database? So essentially, can you share your configuration of, you know, for specific designs? Yeah, you, you could. Um, so the way it works, and this is where it's gonna start getting a bit more complex and, and people are gonna have questions is, these databases can be stored anywhere. So the XML file, if I go into um, back into Infinite Openings, and I'll, I'll demonstrate this just briefly. I won't demonstrate the whole thing, but I'll show you where it is. So I'll just select one of these. And there's settings, uh, go back to components. We have three different locations for the database. Local means it's loaded within the local library. That includes when you're using a BIM server library. Remote is you can actually store these XML files somewhere outside of your ARCHICAD libraries or you know, whether it be a, a secure site of your um, company intranet, uh, a URL or anything like that. Um, and then to access that, you use uh, settings in the model view options to define the path. So go into model view options and you go into data and these define the path of where you're storing that remote data um, if you're using the remote version so you could do it in the url so effectively what we could have is we could have a shared um, url when when this our next website is created which is going to be the portal for how all this content is is managed um, and how your subscriptions are managed and it's going to be far more intelligent. Um, got some really good programmers putting that together. Um, we can have a spot there that can be a shared database that everyone can access. So you can upload things that people can share and, and, and that sort of thing. If you're talking more specifically within your office, then it's up to you as to how many different versions of these databases you have, whether you have company specific, project specific, and, and all those sorts of things. That is all possible within this object, but You'll probably want to talk to me about that to have that explained to you in a little bit more detail as to how it's so, done. That. So if if uh, I have a project and I've created some stuff with um, infinite openings, 
and yes. I send it over to someone else, or I have someone else in the office who's uh, doing it, and, and they've got the license, they've downloaded and activated the tool, then it should just come across like a normal library part. They have it. They have it there straight away because you're updating the library that they're also using. And this is another thing that we found out with the BIM server. It's actually fantastic. It's kind of a little bit. It, it kind of seems like a bit of a security risk, but it's not. Um, it's, it's really clever. When you upload, when you store a new component, when you're working on a teamwork project, that goes straight to the BIM server library, straight to that XML file, and then straight out to everyone who's using it. They don't even need to send and receive. There's no, there's no re reserving of the XML databases. There's no sending and receiving. Um, that's the, one of the real magical things about this is ARCAD reads that XML instantaneously from where it's sitting. Uh, so, so that's the definition. Really if you have a, a re redesign, a revision, <clears throat> it'll happen. Now, do you have any management stuff to restrict, you know, like in the case of the Queen's Wharf, <clears throat> you know, that would restrict only to BIM managers or, or senior people? Yeah, so that's, at, at the moment, it's a little bit, uh, um, let me just go back into the, the tool and show you. So the only real control we have at the moment is this password, which now you can all see it and it's all on, on YouTube and all that sort of thing as well. It's not really a secret password, but this password is what allows you to modify the database. If I don't have that password in there, then I don't get the upload function. Mm -hmm. So I, I can't modify the database. And so that password, with, that password that you were putting in there is for you, this specific database and each database has a password. No, no, it's just for the object in general. So it's the one password to rule all. Um, and now that most people know about it, it's not really a secret. So it's not, it's not that great of security. Um, what I'm doing with this though, is I'm transitioning this into a, a function that is going to allow each company or each user to define the password for their company. Mm -hmm. uh, so that will enable you to have your own secret sort of protection of those databases who, who can read and write to and from them. Okay, all right. So you're working on management and security there. Uh, yeah, so you, you'll be able to create your own password and, and then control it that way. Hopefully we'll, we'll then also get that a lot to be a lot more advanced and give you flexibility for different data. I think that's quite a good idea. Different passwords for different databases, you know, could be a really good way to do things. You're right. Okay. So Sasha, you know, the answer is a little bit more complex than I thought, but ultimately, yes, you can share things and uh, that uh, Christian is thinking of how to manage it so that there can be more widespread sharing as well as uh, company internal sharing. Um, mm -hmm. Richard White says, what should we be asking window manufacturers to do to get into Infinite? In other words, uh, what, uh, do you have just a simple thing saying, um, hey, you know, consider this? Yeah. Look, uh, I mean, um, we basically just need them to provide their, their drawings of their products, the, the drawings and, and list of the products that they want, and then I'll communicate with them and and get that going. Um, but right so, now, they will have to pay for it because that's the whole idea here, right? To No, 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 there's no paying. No one pays for anything. The manu well, who, who, uh, where's the funding coming from? The manufacturer will pay, they will, they will pay a subscription fee to have their product. So it's a very small fee. Um, this is something that we, manufacturers pay a lot of money to have their BIM content developed, like you would, you would be probably disgusted with the amount of money that people are charging um, for that sort of thing. Um, this system, I can create their content in less than a tenth of the time of the traditional. So, you know, those savings get passed on to the manufacturer immediately. So it's a very, very minor cost for a manufacturer to put, if they just wanted to put say two or three products within this element, it's probably only going to cost them, you know, 150 Australian dollars or something like that. It, it's an extremely small cost. Um, and if they have a, a specifier, so if one of one of the users of this tool has a specific project that they want the content for, or if it's their regular supplier and they know that they're going to use it, then they'll be more than happy to provide that information at such a, um, a cheap cost. And then right. and sure that, that gets through to everyone else. So, so you basically need 
to tell the manufacturer that this is the new way of doing things, this is a new possibility, and we can have the content developed in a tenth of the traditional time and at a tenth of the cost, basically. Okay, all right. Well, uh, there's a few things that you can keep in mind, Richard, and everybody else. And uh, uh, Christian, perhaps I'll work with you to to create some sort of boilerplate, uh, you know, yeah. letters or or language that could be uh, could be shared. Yeah, look, that would be great. There's definitely, and I'm sure some of you are aware that in talking with me, it's, my head is so much in the code at the moment. You know, strengths with communication with different um, entities is not really one of my things. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm, right. and I, I, I'm thick skinned and I, I don't mind taking, you know, constructive criticism. Um, you know, tell me where I'm going wrong in, in certain things and, and give advice, and I'll take that all on board. Um, and, and try and deliver people what they really need. All right, well, that is great. By the way, Rob Rosen says, thanks. What happened to your long hair? <laughs> it got in the way. Um, <laughs> that, that was a while ago. I had, yeah, I had dreadlocks for about 15 years and it just, it, they became so big and um, they just, yeah, too much to manage, far mm -hmm. too much to manage. Just right. watching it was like a, you know, a five-step process. So, no, had to go. Mm. I like um, to be efficient. I like to be efficient in everything. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I have some more thank some thank yous from people who had to go. Um, Michael Alder says, "Hey, mate, is the subscription desk-based or project-based when working on teamwork projects?" Um, the subscription is not based on anything. In fact, <laughs> so. It's it's not desk or project based. It's not linked to any sort of license or or anything like that. So um, it's basically just a a legal thing. So um, if you just have the subscription for one license, you can still use that throughout the, the your um, your office on as many projects. You can take it home with you. You can basically do whatever you want with it. There's no there's no controlling of that aspect. Okay, that's that's great. There is, that, that's been left open for, you know, that's a major thing. That's not just sort of like, oh, I don't know how to control it, so I haven't. That's been my um, protocol for many years because people want to share their their files with consultants and all other sorts of things, even as simple as sending a file to China for rendering services or something like that. You want all the components to be in there and, and that sort of thing. So I'm not, there is no physical locking of the, the licensing of these tools. Right, so uh, I'll just compare it to uh, Master Template. So I've developed Master Template over the years and because it's intended to be an office template and an office standard, you know, one license fee covers it, whether you're a single person or you have 10 or 20 or whatever number of uh, computers that uh, use it. Uh, the only thing I ask as an honorable thing is uh, if somebody else wants to use it, another company, another you know colleague in another firm, um, that they pay for it separately. Now, if you share it with a consultant to work on a project, you know, you're working jointly on it, no problem. But if someone's going to use it as part of their office, their their own projects, then, you know, it's good to pay for the intellectual property of the IP. And I'm okay. sure you would appreciate that as well, um, uh, Christian, is, is that if someone else, you know, obviously we're giving away the free infinite openings for a year and the other ones for a limited period, uh, but if you do share it around, make sure that everybody registers, um, uh, you know, outside of your office. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Roy Kindred says, can we modify these elements in section? So uh, obviously you can select them in section and edit the parameters and they will then update. Uh, but do you have hotspots in section? Um, I mean, how editable are some um, of them? Yes. So if you're talking about a, a window, let's just do do something like that. It's, I'll get rid of this one so I've got a bit more space. I'll show you something pretty funny. Cool. Um, open up this section. So the general shape of the element, hmm, all those leftover dimensions, let's just get rid of them. If I select this element, I'm just going to go to one of the, uh, the other ones. So I've got a series of, um, oh, where are those ones gone in the shape? Set that all to custom, go down to our shape. And so 
there's a few, I, I created this video a few years ago demonstrating the geometry of it. And so I've got some funny little ones here. So I've got this one here. This is um, my flying pig. Let me just go turn these door panels off. You know, all elements so we can see it. Okay, there's my flying pig. Now, this is a, a, not the nicest one to mess around with because there's, there's quite a lot of geometry in it, but you can, these hotspots do indicate that you can go in and, and start playing around with this thing. So if I go back to my component catalog, I go back to that shape because it, it's locked to that shape at the moment. So I'll unlock that, click OK. And then you can see in the section view, I can come down here and I can start editing things. I'll give him a slightly bigger nose. This one's a bit slow to respond because it's so complex. Okay, so in an elevation, in an elevation, or I guess in a 3D view, uh, these points are editable um, in a similar way to how they're yes. what you demonstrated on the plan. Yes, um, that's right. So you can go in the 3D view here and you can edit them up in here as well. And so now it's like a pig okay. with a rhino. Um, so uh, a very critical question, but I'm sure it has a good, simple answer is, is this only available as metric or would it be converted for us in the USA? No, it's converted for you as a, as a standard um, part of, of um, Archicad. Well, I don't do that conversion myself. Um, it's just part of the way Archicad works. So if I'm in, if I go down into GDL is is um, is scripted in metric. So if I go to where are we? Uh, we can just simply say Archicad is bilingual. It speaks metric native uh, as its native language, but it will mm -hmm. speak feet and inches if that's what you prefer. So you exactly. just working units okay. or, or you put this library into your US project. And yes. since you set up your units for feet and fractional inches, then all the data will show up there. So, um, you know, you, you type in five foot six. It'll yeah, that's correct. So you can see that now. It's just a matter of the settings within Archicad that control how this object is interpreted. It's not something that I control. So it's a really great thing from Graphisoft that they, they've done that. Yeah, okay. Um, so Malcolm Lear says, when you send an archive file, what happens to this content? So basically, if, if it's not connected to a database, if it's been archived, um, like if it can't find the database, can it, does it yeah, still so have a local so copy? Yeah, this, this this is actually comes back to with the problems I had in the past with you know things slowing down and and all that sort of stuff and having to work out ways to speed them up. The data gets sucked into the instance of the object, so it's not reading the database constantly. It's only reading the database at the moment you click the upload or the moment you click the download button. When you click the download button, all that information is sucked into the object and and put into an array, um, so that those arrays basically store all the data if we just look at the object here um, this is the embedded data that i have for my assemblies so that's all come out of the database and it sucks it in and it puts it in there so when you archive a project it's saving all those elements with that information that's in them so it doesn't matter what you do to the database if you then modify the database then you open up that archive and you want to Relink it back to that database, then you just hit the download button again. Make sure it's it's pointed at the right database, and you hit that download button again, and that'll refresh all the data. But it does it does take that little snapshot of it in time, so that you can rely on it being how you last left it. Yeah. So it sounds like it's the best of all worlds, where you have the data, you're not going to risk losing anything. Uh, no. And if you want to update and and get the latest version of things then you can do that but one of the things you talked about that was interesting is you know that you're updating your tools to make them you know just add more features etc and you're making sure that these tools when they read the data for elements that are in a project that they always have the same result in other words your new tools add new functionality but they don't you know they don't change no it always has the same result the, the integrity of what someone has put in their model is, is the key thing. Right, okay, excellent. 
Um, all right, so uh, Rich Matthews. Rich Matthews, you may know, he's in uh, Ozzy. Um, I had to break off to answer a client call and miss the free download info. Is there a coupon code? Yes, the coupon code is Bobro2020. Bobro so capital B for the first letter. And then, yeah, there we go. And so that's what you put in when you're saying um, that you're about to purchase it. Instead of putting in a credit card, you use the coupon or the discount code. It goes to free and then you, you can check out. And then Christian has to send you actually the file because the one that's on the website, uh, I guess, is, you know. Yeah, it's locked for security reasons. Yeah, okay. Um, so uh, Luther asked, did you say we can also download the Swift joinery? So uh, you'll be, people will get a, you said a two and a half month license for other parts yeah, as well? Yeah, so don't, don't do that in the download when you go onto the website because that coupon code only applies to the Infinite Openings tool specifically. Um, so it won't give you a discount on anything else. But I will, the resulting library that I will send you, send everyone who has um, downloaded the Infinite Openings and anyone who contacts me via email um, due to this uh, presentation, um, it will include uh, a subscription to uh, Infinite Joinery till I think it's May, 25th of May, 24th or 25th of May this year. So you'll have a couple months, a little more than two months to, um, to play around with those tools as well. Uh, the joinery, the ceilings, the, the gutter plus, um, uh, the capping tool, sinks and basins, um, and this new one that I created not so long ago uh, called Infinite Openings. I mean, sorry, Infinite Anything, which is just, I used it to create a truss because I needed, I couldn't get the truss design that I wanted to. Um, but this part goes into there's components for different elements. So you basically can um, go to an element and you can nominate it as being the matter and the void, and then you can draw the shape of those elements. So you can sort of, and then obviously it works with the component catalog. So you can store what you've just created. So once you've done that, so you can see I've stored that as, as the trust and the spandrel and, and those sorts of things. Okay, um, so we do have to finish up. Um, yeah. We've done two hours and time has yeah. flown. So I want to thank you, Christian, for your uh, fascinating presentation and your generosity in sharing this with Archicad users and your creativity for not only creating these things, but thinking of the business model that's going to allow um, down the line these to be used without charge by users and uh, an economic um, sort of framework where for manufacturers it becomes uh, a very small investment and you know significant upside. So well done, well done. Thanks, Eric. Um, just a couple of things. I, you know, definitely thanks goes to Graphisoft for creating this stuff because I didn't, I didn't anticipate all these efficiencies that we'd be able to gain even for the, you know, the the economy of the thing being able to make it available free and and the manufacturers still also paying a lot less than what they're currently paying for traditional BIM content. So what Graphisoft have done made available for us with this XML add-on and with the raise in GDL is just phenomenal. So very grateful for them. Um, and also Eric, I wanted to thank you for having me on here. This has sort of been an ambition of mine. You know, we sort of set, when we're trying to get to certain things, we set certain goals for ourselves and, and coming on and presenting for you is has been an ambition of mine for a, a little while now. So I'm, I'm very pleased that you've um, you've had me on and I'm, it's it's a real positive for my whole career. So thank you. Yeah, well, my pleasure. And I want to thank all of you who have uh, joined us. Uh, we still actually have 127 people sitting, watching, right. wrapped, uh, you yeah, know. Absolutely. So that's great. Um, I'm, I'm sure some, some who had to leave uh, early, but um, uh, we'll be, I'll be posting this on my YouTube channel. Uh, so youtube.com slash Eric Bobro will get you there. And uh, so you'll be able to watch it again if you want. And uh, what's the best email address for people to reach you, Christian? Uh, it's just my first name, Christian, which is spelled with a K. So it's K-R-I-S-T-I-A-N at cadswift.com.au. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, Christian. So uh, uh, look forward to uh, following up with you. We'll get the word out more. Um, and perhaps I can help you with the marketing communication stuff um, in certain ways. So.
Fantastic. Thank you, Eric. I appreciate it greatly. And, and thanks everyone for attending. It's been a, a fantastic event for me. Ta. All right. Well, take care. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, everybody. Okay, Ty. Bye.